It was the spring of the year 1894, where I felt myself being confronted with a case that only my friend, Sherlock Holmes, would be able to solve. At the time, I felt a great sorrow in not being able to be by Holmes' side. Suffice to say, he had left my life forever, and all who knew him had long accepted that he was dead, his broken body lying at the bottom of Reckenbach Falls. Despite this, I decided to put my personal feelings aside and give my full attention to the current case at hand. My time spent with Sherlock had developed my peculiar fondness for solving crimes, which was something that worried me greatly. To the dismay of what seemed to be the whole Indian population, the Honorable Ronald Adair was murdered under the most unusual and inexplicable circumstances. This in and of itself wasn't something of special significance. It wasn't as though this case wasn't something of interest, but something happened that afforded me the greatest shock and surprise in any event in my adventurous life. Even now, after ten years, I still find myself thrilling over the thought, feeling once more the sudden flood of joy. The day of this event started like any other. I woke up at approximately 6.30 a.m. and was warmly greeted by Molly, my maid. Good day to you, Mr. Watson. Oh, you went to the club again. I sat down in my study and read the morning news. Just as I read the headline, I heard a knock at the door. The maid abruptly gave me a telegram. I already anticipated what was on it. When I read it, it came to me at no surprise that it was Scotland Yard asking for my assistance on the Ronald Dare murder case. Cheerio, Mr. Watson. Cheerio. Hop on. Okay. Yes, sir. Get right. Get right away, sir. Upon arrival at the crime scene, I was walked through number 427 Parkland. The coroner led me to Adair's body, which lay in his room. I was informed that prior to the murder, he had come back from gambling. He insisted on spending the evening with the relation. Adair was found dead near his table, his head terribly mutilated by an expanding revolver bullet. However, no weapon of the sort was found in the room. On the table lay two 10 pound bacon tips, as well as 17 pounds in gold and silver. Given my minute examination of the circumstances, the evidence served only to make the case more complex. In the first place, no reason could be given as to why the young man would have locked the door from the inside. The only means of escape from the murder would have been the one unlocked window in the room. The drop was, however, at least 20 feet, and a bed of flowers lay in full bloom directly beneath. Neither the flowers nor the earth showed any signs of being disturbed, and the strip of grass separating the house from the road remained untouched. Therefore, it must have been the young man himself who fastened the door. But how did he come about his death? No witness had reported a gunshot, and yet there was a dead man, and there was a revolver bullet, which had mushroomed out, as soft-nosed bullets will, and inflicted a wound that would cause instantaneous death. Such were the circumstances of, Park, of the Park Lane mystery, which were further complicated by complete absence of motive, since Adair was not known to have any enemy, and there had been no attempt to remove any of the valuables from the room. I soon left the crime scene and decided to go on a stroll through the park. Absorbed in my own thoughts of the crime, I bumped into an elderly looking man and knocked down several of the books that he was carrying. It struck me that the old fellow was some poor bibliophile who, either as trade or hobby, collected obscure volumes. I slumped into a park bench and went over my observations of number 427 Park Lane, although it did little to clear up the problem in which I was interested. It seemed as though there was no way in which the murderer could have entered or exited the house through the window. I sat in relative silence until someone sat down next to me. I turned to face him and was met with the face of the old man. You're surprised to see me. Yes, yes I am. Well, uh, 
I can't see you sitting on this park bench, and I, I decided that I should apologize for my previous gruff manner. I really didn't mean it as such. Also, I wanted to thank you for helping me pick up my books. They mean quite a lot to me. You make too much trouble. You look somewhat familiar. Well, uh, I do own a bookstore on the corner of Church Street, so I'm sure you'd see me around. Although, I did recognize you. What sort of volumes do you collect? My dear Watson, I'm almost offended by your terrible lack of memory. Oh my god! Holmes! In disguise! Watson! Watson! Are you awake? Watson! Holmes! Is that really you? Yes. Yes it is. But you died, didn't you? Alas, I didn't. But that's a tale for another time. I'll tell you once we get back to Baker Street. Baker Street? My brother Mycroft maintained it for me. He was actually my only confidant while I was away. You know, I owe you an apology. I wasn't able to tell anybody of my continued survival, including you. Well, I'm sure you had your reasons. Yes. Of course I did. But you know, I didn't come to London for nothing. You are in a case. We'll see. It felt like old times. At that hour, I found myself seated behind a tree, revolver in my pocket, Holmes standing next to me, and the thrill of adventure coursing through my veins. Holmes stood still and silent, and I could barely hear the sound of his breathing. Why the devil are we here? Weren't we bound for Baker Street? Damn it, man. Trust view of our old little flat. Now look at the window. Look at the Tell me what you think. Well, good heavens, it's marvelous. I should be prepared to swear that it was you. The credit of the execution is due to Monsieur Oscar Meneur of Grenoble. He spent some days working on the figure. It's a bust of wax. The rest I arranged in a visit to Baker Street this afternoon. But why? Because. The rooms are being watched. By who? By my old enemies, Watson. My enemies whose leader lies in the bottom of Reichenbach Fall. They and only they knew of my continued existence. The back for me. They saw me arrive this morning, evidently. How did you know of this? Because I recognized the sentinel when I glanced out the window this morning. He's a harmless enough fellow. Park is his name. I really care nothing of him. However, I did care a great deal of the more formidable person who stood behind him. Colonel Sebastian Moran is his name. He is definitely a force to be reckoned with, being one of the most cunning and dangerous criminals throughout London. This is the man who is after me tonight. However, unbeknownst to the hunter, we are actually the ones who are doing the hunting. My friend's plans were gradually starting to unfold. From this angle, we would easily be able to see what the two hunters were doing, except that they were our prey and we would soon be upon them. We watched the figures for a while longer, and Sherlock became impatient, as made evident by his incessant fidgeting and tapping. I gazed upon the silhouette in the window across the street, and was afforded a surprise almost as great as before. The shadows moved! Of course it moved! Do you think I would erect an obvious dummy in hopes it fools one of the sharpest men in Europe? Mrs. Hudson has moved it eight times in the last two hours, or once every fifteen minutes. I... Man of Scotland Yard. I'll go over the details with you tomorrow, all right? All right. Go. You fiend! You sly, cunning fiend! Ah. Ah. Watson. <laughs>